Welcome to Pull Request or It Didn't Happen. Um, and we're really excited to kick things off today. I'm going to play uh, a bit of an MC and I have two very uh, esteemed guests who are gonna join this conversation. Uh, Raj, who he's the Senior Platform Security Manager at ActBlue. And we have Jack Zaris, who's uh, here at KSOC. He's our Director of Sales Engineering. So uh, welcome to the two of you. And you know we, we are doing something a little different today. We're not gonna uh, flip through a bunch of slides. We have some conversation points we wanna hit. And we uh, also want to engage with you all who took the time out of your day to, uh, to attend this. So again, welcome. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen so you could see our lovely tired faces. I think we are all parents of young children. So um, none of us sleep very well at night. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and we'll get going. So let us kick things off. And we are going to start that by setting the stage. Um, we're here to talk about remediation, GitOps. Uh, there's, there's, there's some buzzwords and some acronyms involved, uh, but I think they're really important ones. And I think it's uh, we have the right team here to kind of discuss these topics. So off the bat, um, this one's for you, Raj. What's GitOps? What, do, what are you doing at ActBlue that's, that's different? How do you embrace this uh, whole notion of GitOps? And what does it mean for your security team that you're building? Yep, yep, yep. <clears throat> so, hey, everyone. Thanks for that awesome intro. GitOps, 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 GitOps. GitOps is something that I would say is not something necessarily so new. However, to kind of provide what I believe the definition is that resonates most current day, current time is CNCF sort of blessed golden path to ensure that you can codify your workloads and your clusters for Kubernetes in code and operationalize that code in a way that gets the things out into production, right? And that generally means, I think right now, Flux, Customize, a little bit of Terraform, uh, Cloud Independence, um, some sort of standardization on like... Uh, what you expect to be codified in the code bases, what do you expect to not happen um, with your infrastructure, that sort of stuff. But I want to like, before I like end it, is that idea of getting things statically defined as early as possible and having your production infrastructure represent, be represented by static definition and have your production infrastructure be able to be spun up somewhat programmatically and, and by static definition, that is like what I just think about when I think GitOps. And like, just to share these concepts, these are not necessarily super new. Lots of organizations I've been a part of have aspired to get to these sort of things, like way back to like the Etsy days where we shipped all the things and like we had it just generally running relatively well where infrastructure could be like spun up statically, where we codify infrastructure as the OS that was installed in the bare metal, the LAMP stack essentially, because we were way back in the day, we actually had LAMP stacks like that did all the stuff uh, that were codified um, via Chef and a little bit of Python and a little bit of uh, just Bash doing some funky stuff. And it operationalized in like this orchestrated that we had in-house, in right? All the way up to like mid-career where, you know, I was uh, Spotify, we used a lot of Puppet. We were a little bit more native, um, dot, a little bit more native with Docker, but not Kubernetes. So we like had our own orchestration layer called Helios and not Kubernetes. But again, we codified things in code and we relied on that. And like we were relatively confident if we poked into a random production box, we would see something that exists there and know how to map it back to somewhere it was statically defined. And we're confident that's, you know, that is the state of truth. So that's what I think about GitOps. It's like this progression of what everyone wanted for a long time, for a decade now, to the world that we lived in today, which is Kubernetes pods, CNCF, and the tech stack around there. That's how I would set the stage. Jack, what are your thoughts? Okay. So uh, for me, it's um, looking at more from the security side. Uh, I've worked as a, a sales engineer. I've worked as a um, product manager. And, and we talked about this a little bit, a bit earlier where security was... Um, somewhat detached from the actual work of securing the application. Um, and mm -hmm. 
they didn't they, they didn't have i don't want to say uh, probably accountability would be the right word they weren't really accountable and what when we're talking about not necessarily get outs but the, you know, the topic of this conversation or part of the topic of this conversation is remediation as code is getting security involved in the GitOps process by introducing security remediation as code into, mm. into GitOps. Mm. Uh, so th from the security side, that's where I see um, uh, a remediation as code playing is uh, security now having skin in the game rather than they give, they, they give you reports, they tell you what, you know, the development team, what they sh should be doing. Instead, they're actually making the changes themselves through the CI/CD pipeline via mm -hmm. via get uh, via get and having that all audited, um, so I, I, I see that you, I, I could see your brain going like you have thoughts on that. Go go. Yeah. So what you're saying is GitOps is an opportunity. We didn't even plan that, but that's like totally exactly the thing, right? GitOps is an opportunity. Yeah. What's the opportunity? It's the opportunity for a security team, perhaps to more easily and more effectively get involved on the engineering side, on the deployments of remediation side, because perhaps mm -hmm. in a world that, uh, in an organization that's not strongly adopting GitOps paradigms, it may be unreasonable to assume your security engineer can do uh, direct kube cuddle commands against the production infrastructure for to affect the change. It may be unreasonable for your security engineer to go in and tweak uh, a SQL config in your production database, because you don't have that experience. You don't understand the other side effects. But in a world where you are living in an organization that does adopt GitOps forward paradigms, it's more reasonable to expect a security engineer to understand the tool chain that implements GitOps as per CNCF, namely customizing Flux. And it's actually maybe more reasonable to expect a security engineer to learn it and to not feel that that's a wasted skill. It's not like they're going to leave that organization and have to relearn a new stack where you know for an SRE, maybe that's an expected like skill set to be able to learn new stacks. But for a security engineer, learning GitOps, like modern GitOps technologies and um, languages is not a skill that is wasted. So we can expect our security engineers to learn it and then to, through the process of learning it, PR directly against it. That's what I heard you say. That sounds good to me. So does uh, that, that starts to sound a lot like security engineers should be able to read and write code. Is that is that what we're we're implying here? That's a very hot I mean, take. <laughs> maybe not. Maybe not Java. Maybe not. Maybe not Python. But uh, infrastructure is code. Code. Uh, no. Networking uh, as code. Code. Um, uh, you and I talked about this ye uh, yesterday, Jimmy. Again, through a kind of a sales engineering lens. Like, how many sales presentations have you sat in on? I know I, every sales presentation I've been handed always had either a circle or a figure eight. Like we, the, this security <laughs> product fits into your pipeline automatically feeds, but usually what it's doing is it finds a security issue and it just notifies somebody. It doesn't actually complete any circle. Somebody's got to do work to complete that circle to, to, to mm. finish it. But, um, uh, but feeding the remediation in as code when you find an issue I, it just occurred to me yesterday, like that actually does complete the loop. It actually, mm. you find a security issue, you check in what you think the remediation is uh, via pull request, and it you know can fix that issue. It actually can, in reality, start to complete that circle rather than it's just a marketing slide. So why'd you hedge your bets a little bit by saying, oh, maybe a security engineer doesn't need to know how to write Java and Python, but only infra as code. Why, why hedge your bets there? Why not say no, know it all? Or as much as your stakeholders, you expect your stakeholders to somewhat know here. No, you're right. You're right. Uh, so maybe it's dip your, that's the goal. Uh, typically, the security engineers know things like, like networking security. That's, that's one of the places they've, they've been in most often, or OS security patches, things like that. Uh, mm. And that's the first step is, is uh, mm. security, un understanding uh, infrastructure as code, networking as code with the goal of getting to applications, actual application mm. code. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, it may be too much to say, just jump into there right away. Cause that's not their, not, depends on the security engineer, mm. uh, what their area of expertise is, but you're right. Uh, maybe so there's another opportunity, right? Yes. Like yes. the other opportunity then is, yes. <clears throat> and the, uh, just, I mean, hedging bets, like hedging it a little bit, a little bit here, 
one big reason I'm super excited about being a an advisor for you all is because I get to hopefully in, encourage certain types of philosophies on, on how you solve the problem. One mm. philosophy that I'll bring up right now is the tool that is KSOC when providing remediation as code is also providing a safe guardrail for security engineers to not mess it up too badly because yes. you spent all the time yes. already hopefully recommending a potential fix in code that you are relatively confident you understand the side effects you probably will have some training behind it you'll probably be able to help the security engineer through the usage of the tool become a better builder so the idea is that like for other tools out there not just like iac type things like this but if uh, you're talking about like first party code scanning tool suites that are like machine learning enabled and you know find like low signal source ratio and like can auto remediate stuff even there the way i think about those sort of partnerships is like i want the remediation to be able to teach my security engineers a little bit of code as well, help them out, build the confidence that this is fine. And like, I think that's the the, the cool thing here with, with KSOC is it's not going to be overnight that we expect, or we think the industry will expect all, let's just say infrastructure security engineers to be able to PR directly against your GitOps uh, repo and deploy to prod. It won't be an overnight thing, but can we, no. as a new fledgling group of folks, help that group become better over a period of time by providing the guardrails, by building the confidence, either through like really, really strong remediation annotations, some training, some evangelizing. I think so. No, you, yeah. you, you caught me. You totally caught me there because I exposed my own personal trepidation, like infrastructure code, networking is code. Totally. I've been playing in that arena for, for quite a while, but actually, you know, I, I can, I can read application code, but I would be, a little hesitant uh, to to propose uh, to actually roll out fixes, but I think that gets to the point. In GitOps, mm -hmm. you propose a change; it gets basically peer reviewed uh, and checked and audited before it gets before it gets sent out. So a lot of that trepidation should should go away. You're not actually making changes into production; you're proposing, and then the uh, the, the application developers in this in this particular case would go over that and, and make sure that what you're doing is sound. Mm -hmm. Let me um, give a, a concrete example. As, a, as we are a, a, a relatively new company, we had to build our own infrastructure, right? And you see Steve Wade in chat here. He's, he's our uh, senior principal, all things platform engineer and, uh, and backend engineer, and he brings more IAC and GitOps experience to the table than I have ever really encountered in my career mm -hmm. thus far. So as a as a green field opportunity, we we codified everything, right? Like you can't even create a GitHub repository without it being as part of Terraform. Um, it's a kind of a, a running joke, adding users. We have all of the AWS accounts set up. Everything is checked in as code. And while that may seem overkill, it really isn't because now when I need a Git repository, the process isn't a point and click kind of operational uh, uh, snowflake uh, event that's happened. It's actually going through the rigor of linting. It's going through all sorts of pre-commit hooks. We have security checks to make sure you don't have uh, secrets stored in, in, in a particular um, Git commit. We have peer review. We have this, this process that is really powerful to make sure that that is a rebuildable solidly sound like sound infrastructure from ideation to production and that to me as you know uh, um, watching it kind of come up from from nothing from signing up for the first aws account at a company to something that lets developers and security teams safely deploy an application or a microservice or a config to an api gateway is uh, is really confidence inspiring, right? It's it's less intimidating after the plumbing is in place, and mm -hmm. you know your automation is taking care of eighty percent of of the hard work. And yes, there's people involved, but GitOps really lets you move much much faster. And watching it as a net new versus bolting it onto existing kind of patchwork infrastructure has been um, very eye opening in its capability. So. Um, on that Something note, I want to like, well, before you get too yeah. far from that, go, like, go, yeah. At some point, KSOC is going to be a $2 billion company with uh, like 
30 employees. And uh, some point later in the future, it'll be a $100 billion company with 3,000 employees, let's say. And at some point, you're going to have a security team. And your security team is going to be charged with uh, making sure that something good is happening. And at some point, you're going to have a security engineer that's going to say, ah, fucking hell, I have no idea how to follow this paradigm and use this cookie cutter template and then deploy this thing that has convention all over the place. I'm just going to go make a security AWS account and be a, like a little snowflake off to the side and solve the problems that way. And at some point, someone's going to have to be okay with that or not be okay with that. And I'm saying that as like, that is going to happen. No matter mm -hmm. how awesome mm -hmm. you, Jimmy, think your developer experience is right now, someone will not like it when there's a thousand people in the organization. And then I guess before we move too far on, like what's your thoughts and feelings and how you avoid that perhaps, how you address that? Is that a truth? Is that not a truth? Because every organization I've been a part of where I was in IC, I did it. I was like, I don't get this. And I, I'm a particularly good developer-ish at the time when I was doing it. Like I, I felt like I could figure it out. But I was just like, this is going to be too long for me to do the thing. I'm going to go into AWS, go to Rapid3 and add a subdomain because I did not want to PR against the zone file management configy thing. And I did it myself. Mm -hmm. And then I got away with it because my manager didn't care. But now that I'm on the other side a little bit, I'm a suit. I call it out every single time now. And it does mean that I tell my CISO, it's going to take us a week to add a subdomain because we're learning how to do it because our developer experience is something that we're not, a, we're not accustomed to, but I hold a specific value important to me. Start building, do the building. You'll get faster at it and you'll be a partner with your DevX teams to improve it myself or uh, yourself. So like, I'm just throwing it out there. What you just said sounds awesome now for your five person team. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's true. Sure it stays it, the, awesome. The, the scale is, um, so there's one way I've seen this kind of sort of work in, in my past life. I was uh, uh, at a kind of consumer mobile app company. We had a very large infrastructure and we would do, uh, it's basically introducing chaos experiments. Uh, you know, we didn't call it that, but repaving where we would take down infrastructure at random times. Uh, and it put the fear of God in, in development because if you're building something on the security side, it wasn't in Git, it didn't go through, we were using Puppet, it didn't have all the, the, the pieces and you were kind of SSHing and making your own configs. There was the real chance that that night it could all be gone and your work mm -hmm. would just go away. So it forced you through a path of, you know, the, you know this has to be durable, right? And mm -hmm. Git is the only way to make it durable because that's where things, that's our source of truth that we've settled on. Um, that doesn't work everywhere, obviously. It's, a, it's an extreme end of, of that, but... I think culturally it's uh it's important to to have kind of like evangelists inside that are are mm. helping people because it's hard when you're introduced to Terraform in a big organization and you just need to make like a C name change or something like yep I will admit it is not the most uh approachable subject so mm. you need advocates who are going to help you get through that and Do you the think last you need point, advocates at the business leadership, like the non-tech business leadership to understand that well enough to advocate all the way up to the CEO? Do you think that's a requirement? Yeah, because you're going to take more time. I, the first mm. six months are going to be harder than click ops. Like mm. click ops will always win for speed, uh, mm. but there's a resilience factor to get ops that can't be understated. So um, the you know, the last thing that the, the thing we're working on at KSOC, at least in the context of Kubernetes, is it is drift detection, right? Drift mm -hmm. is it's really important to understand what's happening in code, typically is not one-to-one -one with what's happening in runtime, whatever that runtime may be. We enable that in Kubernetes because cube cube control, right? Or whatever. Uh somebody SSH to some machine introduced a couple new workloads for a test environment, they somehow made it into production and they're not reflected back in the actual YAML manifests. That's a that's a security finding in, if you're doing this right, right? It's like, you don't want snowflakes because ultimately that cluster will go away, the nodes will go down, workloads will get shifted, moved, and if they're not tracked, they're, they're as good as gone. So mm -hmm. um, I think drift detection, you know, it's kind of early days, like using that in security, but
but it's something we're working on because you should be closer to one to one um, from code to runtime, well, and there's a big gap there today. So the reality is that every once in a while, forget about the the person who's like, I don't have time for this. I'm just gonna do it myself. I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna do it the manual way. Uh, if production's on fire. Mm -hmm. and you need to make a change fast like i don't i don't have literally we do not have time for this and we need to temporarily give somebody act direct access to the environment uh to make uh, runtime changes that's that's something we're working on as well to say okay we're going to allow that mm -hmm. but we're going to temporarily allow that kind of access and fully audit it when we give you that access so yep you can't completely close the window on it because there are times when it's not just somebody i don't want to say lazy but uh, they're just, they want to get their job done. They want to get it fast. Yeah. Like there's the, competing the, the, priorities. There's constraints. Yes. There's local rationality. We all get, like, yeah. I'll there say are this. rational this reasons you where... need to do it sometimes. Exactly. Ahead, and um, I mean, I'll say this. Uh, SOX regulations are mm -hmm. a boon, I think, when it comes to something like this. Because if mm -hmm. you actually have to do real SOX stuff um, and like also some like real PCI stuff, the idea is like, auditing and tracking. It's not necessarily blocking, right? Mm -hmm. So sometimes it's easier to block, but sometimes it's just as effective to detect and to allow exception use cases. And mm -hmm. like, if you are implementing PCI backends, uh, like obviously I work at Apple, so there's PCI stuff because there's mm -hmm. money, lots of money, lots of credit cards. Um, if you worked at any publicly traded company and you have to make sure you can ensure that all your plays are like every, very, very accurate because you're spending money and it's material impact, like you're doing sock stuff. If you're a technologist in these places, you start to build this intuition a little bit better where actually it's not about making it impossible. It's allowing for exception use cases, it's allowing for auditability trails. And as a builder in those places, that starts to become relatively natural. What's interesting I would highlight is as a security engineer on most security teams I've been on, we like avoid all the regulation stuff. So we never get to build that intuition. That's someone else's job. That's a GRC mm. person's job and a GRC and developer person's job. And they build that intuition. And all we see is like, wait, you can deploy to, you can force, uh, force push the master, fuck that. You're, that's not allowed because their assumptions, we should block it as opposed to, okay, you can force push the master, assuming there's a link Jira ticket that is of this type that has a, a acceptance flow that was over here that we know is like going to be audited. And then audit trail is like locked down. You can't mess with audit trail. Like you build those intuitions when you are a builder, when you are forced to be, you know, building things in these environments. And like, I think that's amazing to think about all the time. Every time you think about protective controls, like, is it really, does it need to be protective? Can it be more detective? Can it be protective with with um, escape routes because you understand like your business that needs to be agile in incidents, that sort of stuff. Only yesterday, um, we're GitOpsifying some parts of our stack right now. Like we're we're an 18 year old plus company. So we didn't have GitOps, even like the initial definition of GitOps when we first started, it was like click ops and console ops and whatever mm -hmm. you want to call it for a long time. We're GitOpsifying some things right now. And one thing I had a conversation, one of the engineers in the, that's doing this right now, and we're like, I really love that, like, it's fully automated. The documentation shows the fully automated, like, workflow. But uh, before we consider this done, can you also provide me documentation on if we need to manually cut a tag and push something to that environment? What are the, what's the run books? Can we even do that? And if we can do that, how are we double checking that's on the audit trail as well? Like, the project is not done until that piece is also there. This was a conversation we had yesterday. And that's how we uh, we keep it going. Like we make sure every opportunity we have as leaders, we convey these ideas. Like don't be too lazy. Like we are the ones that could be more lazy than anyone else saying that looks secure enough. That's safe by default. That's in the paradigms that any uh, OWASP top 10 webinar thing we'll talk about. We need to make sure like, is it also helping our organization when they need to not do a security thing? And are we thinking about that? We need to learn more about the non-security stuff. I mean, we're, we're all we're all engineers here. If we have a break class moment where, like, look, I need to go around the the approval process or the the normal process of doing things to get my job done because it's an emergency, and you're not and you're blocking me, I'm going to find a way, and it's going to be a way that you don't like, but it's going to get the job done. Provide an escape hatch, a, a release yeah. valve that's approved, uh, that goes through that audit. Uh, you, it behooves you to make that available, otherwise. 
Yes. People are going to find ways to do it, whether you like it or not. Mm -hmm. So Raj, how do you build a team around this? Your, your, your task at, at hand at ActBlue is, you know, platform security. Um, how do you take an existing security team? How do you hire? What's the, what's the leadership mentality that your head is in to actually embrace this um, mm. sort of new newish paradigm? Yep. Uh, so I'll say there's a couple things there. Ooh, I didn't prepare this one. This is gonna be fun. Let's see if this I is, this is look a it up. One. Yeah. Yeah. Um, your team is your team is listening too. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, so I'll say this. I'm lucky that your career is not like a vacuum. So I'll start there. I'm lucky. The journey that got me to act blue is important to understand. And it's also one that may, that kind of makes me select for organizations that are ready for things like this. So like at a very, very, very quick high level, I got to act blue because of a couple of reasons, not the least of which is the current CISO. And I used to work together at Etsy where we admit we both built our values around that were important at the time pre uh, public Etsy, which were sec uh, DevOps, infra as code, uh, heavy CI CD, developer empathy, local rationality. Like these were all very important values that we grew up with in our career at Etsy. So that's the currency. So at act blue. So th that one thread means that there's at least some value alignment between myself and the person who I am reporting to. So there's that thing, there's value alignment. Um, and what are those values? They're aligned because of the Etsy stuff. They're aligned because we all have alumni Slack. So we, we've been keeping up and keeping in contact through our career growth. And we've been comparing notes regularly. So not only is there value alignment because we started at the same place, there's been continual value alignment as we meant, as we compared notes and chatted different places we've been. So like why that's important is like, I knew already that this sort of concept is something that's there's an appetite for in the existing security leadership at ActBlue. So there's that. Now that doesn't mean like you can still get it, right? Cause like, that's just the one, okay, you're allowed to do it essentially. So then how do you do it successfully? You need more, more pieces of the puzzle here. Other pieces of the puzzle that are relevant are through my career journey. Uh, I tended to be the one who deployed things to production as an engineer. I have totally like I totally brought down Etsy one time cause I was doing a crypto thing and I used up all the entropy on our web servers and TLS just broke. I did that. i Rigged it up. It was fun. It was interesting. I did that. I uh, I was at an embedded systems company and that camera over there, I was the one who specced out the definition on the Atmel chip on it to do some basic crypto offboarding stuff. I was allowed to do it. So I did it. I cost uh, some devs, uh, some uh, what's it called? Manufacturing cycles that were messed up because I, I messed it up, but they allowed me to do it. So that's another piece of the puzzle. As a doer, I also... Uh, had the values of building. So now I knew it's possible. So now as a leader, I decided that when I hire a team and when I interview for a team, I'm very forward with the idea. I, I expect all of us to build. I expect us to develop. I expect us to push code. I expect us to recode. And during that process of interviewing, people fall out of the, the funnel because they don't want to do that. And there's organizations that you don't need to do that. But sometimes when you uh, do that early in the funnel, some people like click. And they are very excited about that. They change the way they're even present, um, co coming to the interview now. They're leading with projects, not hacks. They're leading with bills, not CVEs. Mm. And it's like, oh, this is really cool. So now you, you're acting as a CIV to like build an organization that values some of these priorities. And, and there's that. But there's also this other thing. You can do a lot more internal hiring now. You can find people in the organization who don't want to be the SRE anymore. They don't want to be the director of infra anymore. They maybe want to be a mid-level security person. And what my job is there is to be like, you can teach me a shit ton about building. I hopefully can teach you a shit ton about offensive mindset. Let's put our brains together mm. and codify a project that will mix these things up. And at ActBlue, that's, our, that's my current strategy. I'm lucky. I have like two amazing people on the team that deployed our GitOps and like have been long-term engineers of the organization and fucking really know our infrastructure. And I learn from them every single day about like the ways you should think about like flux and customize. And I also have people on the team who are like really, really badass like pen testers. And we work together. We plan a roadmap out six months on what we want to build. We know that the building part of our roadmap is probably only half of the amount of time we contribute to the company. The other half will be ad hoc things that pop up, bug bounty, security architecture reviews, um, ad hoc, uh, code reviews, that sort of stuff. And 
that's it. We, we execute on that plan for a year and see what we need to do next. That's my long answer to that question. That's good. No, I liked your, uh, I liked all the stories. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's, uh, it's getting, getting out of the internal consultant mindset that we always talk about where you kind of mm-hmm. have this list of issues, you present them in some format and you go about your day. Um, and, you know, to, to plug what we're kind of building at KSOC is that, is that pull request, like the title mm-hmm. pull request or didn't happen. And there's a lot, there's a big difference between a pull request with a first pass at an actual fix than a kind of outstanding ticket in the backlog that may or may not be addressed. The pull request mm-hmm. is where the conversation happens with the right stakeholders. It's where the, you know, the, the SRE comes in and does some regression testing. It's where you can actually have multiple levels of peer review and everybody can see the code. Now, mm-hmm. do tools automatically generate perfect pull requests that can automatically be merged to every environment without looking at them? Absolutely not. But the the conversation that happens in the fixes, the the mm. different the commit history is your is your audit trail, right? Like the audit trail is as clean as it can be when it's in the form of code. So mm-hmm. um, that's what we're trying to build for for Kubernetes um, because it's a messy, complex system. And if you're mm-hmm. already relying on GitOps, we should have a path to fix the code for you, or at yep. least give you that really strong starting point. So, <clears throat> and um, that's a really important key point there. You mentioned something like you just said starting point, and right at the beginning, mm-hmm. you said there's a difference between a bug in a backlog and the initial mm-hmm. pull request. What I want to say is there's bug in a backlog, initial pull request, starting point, the journey through the pull request, all the partnership, all of the learnings, all of the collaboration, and then right before you merge pull requests, that journey is an important journey, and we as security engineers need to do that journey more often because that journey is a very important career growth for everyone who's an engineer. And we, if we don't do that journey in a pull request often enough, we're missing that part of our growth as engineers. And so KSOC can start that journey and allow a secure engineer to start that journey slightly more successfully because they're coming with a little bit more context, a little bit more support, a little bit more understanding that will allow them to show up in the conversation more armed to have those conversations, that's gonna be very important for um, all of us. So Jimmy, I'll can put you, you on the my, spot Can here. you be my boss? Can you be my boss someday, Raj? <laughs> Hopefully not, I need to retire soon. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, no, when I get into politics, retire. it'll be yeah. oh, There you boss. go, when, when you're president, as we talked about earlier. <laughs> go ahead, Jack, sorry. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I'm gonna put you on the spot, Jimmy. So that journey you're talking about. So let's say we, we uh, create a pull request for remediation as code to fix an issue, and you know uh, whatever whatever uh, suggestion we make to, to or remediation we 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 include is not the same as what actually gets implemented. What's the process for then adjusting that in the future? That remediation, uh, that that automated remediation, if that same issue pops up again, how do we mm. feed that 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 journey that learning of Oh, actually, this wasn't exactly what we needed. Machine learning. That's easy. System. Machine learning. Just, you know, yeah. machine learning, AI. You're good. Well, the, the beauty of it, um, we're going to go Inception style here, is like the, reme- the remediation is actually code too. So you have a place to go back to the remediation that created the, the code that created the remediation. And you can you can tweak your your parameters, right? And you yeah. go through the same process over there. It's a new pull request against the remediation, and it's you know specific now to your use case. So that's it. Um, it's code all the way down, right? There's no special magic box that creates remediations um, that aren't, aren't isn't backed by something itself in Git. So you have the conversation over there when you need to improve on remediations. So uh, it's it's. It's very kind of mind boggling, but when you embrace that, it's the changes live there and the conversation happens there. I think, you know, that's, that's the future. So that's how I would answer that. Um, I think we're coming up on uh, time. Raj wants hot takes. Uh, um, I, I mean, you know, we, we've, for some reason, I said a few days ago, we were prepping for this, uh, put the, 
put the engineering back in security engineering. So, you know, I think that's, that's the take it's getting better over the years. Um, mm -hmm. But if you haven't learned, if you're attending uh, this particular session, security folks need to understand the systems they're dealing with. I think that's a hill we're willing to die on uh, as a group yes. here. Now yes. you don't have to be a, uh, you know, some sort of uh, a kind of gray beard, Perl programmer, or Java programmer that only deals with, you know, the, the ins and outs of the application every day, but there is importance in giving security teams autonomy to, you know, use these systems, deploy to them, break stuff. I mean, I've broken, I took down a third of giant mobile application car buying site. Uh, they're, they're by installing a security tool that I didn't understand well enough at the time, mm -hmm. right? And it, it, it broke everything. Uh, we lost a lot of money. This was years ago. Um, and that was on me, but like, how else are you going to learn? Right. So mm -hmm. I think uh, that's, that's kind of the closing note. Um, and, and Raj and Jack, if you have anything else you want to say, uh, now's the time because we're going to wrap things up. I would say uh, you do things to change your philosophies and, and like learn new philosophies. I don't think you say you change a philosophy and then do. I think what I would say is just start doing just as a security leader or a security engineer, security leader, ask people to build something and deploy something. As an engineer, tell your manager, hey, I want to build something and deploy something. See how it feels and then see what happens. Well, um, I mean, for, from the uh, security engineers uh, side, embrace uh, uh, embrace the, the way your developers are working because that's the way the whole organization should be working. Mm -hmm. um, the accountability, um, the auditing, the uh, um, uh, un understanding all aspects of, of the application, not just the application itself, uh, but the infrastructure as well. It, it's all required for, for these applications to work. And nobody should be in a silo anymore. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Everybody has their areas of expertise. So, you know, I'm not going to start developing code, but I should understand by looking at code what it's doing. Um, I should be working in this with the same tools that the developers are using as a security engineer. On that note, Cooper's going to uh, close out the session. And uh, thank you all for coming and bearing with the technical difficulties. Uh, we appreciate being here and check us out uh, at ksoc.com or you can find any of the fine folks here, uh, maybe not on Twitter. I don't know if Jack's there, but you can find him somewhere on the internet. My, my uh, most popular tweet, by the way, is I should use Twitter more often. Every couple of years, I'll write that. That's all I tweet. I, okay. Well, all right. Well, you know, <laughs> just just email Raj and take it back to the, the dinosaur age. Um, all right. Thanks, all. Adios.